Okay, well, good evening, everyone. We are in our uh, section number two tonight in our study of Ryrie's basic theology. Tonight, we are going to be covering the doctrine of inspiration and inerrancy, and uh, that's pretty much all we'll cover from section two. So if you have the book and you're reading ahead or you would like to read ahead, go ahead and begin section three. That's what we'll discuss next week in terms of the doctrine of angels uh, and demons. So that's what we'll be dealing with now. No, this is uh, section two, dealing with the uh, inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. Oh, it is? Okay, maybe section four. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're gonna look at inspiration and inerrancy. Basically answering two questions. One, what is the doctrine of biblical inspiration? And then what is the doctrine of biblical inerrancy? And why is it important? <clears throat> the doctrine of the inspiration of the Bible comes directly from the Bible itself. This is not something that man created and then imposed upon the Bible. Rather, uh, this is the claim that the Bible makes for itself. For example, Paul the Apostle writes, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture, that is both Old and New Testament, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness. So this is what the Apostle Paul claims about the scripture. I think we'll see in a little bit later in the slide, uh, theonoustos is the word in the Greek, Greek text in terms of uh, uh, for the word inspiration, and it actually means to be breathed out. So I guess if you wanted to be accurate, you would say all scripture is expired, meaning it comes from God. Um, but the source is God, and it is profitable for all of the disciplines that we find Paul mentioned. Now, the New Testament uses the word scripture 51 times, and it is always in reference to some part of the Bible. For example, sometimes scripture uh, is describing the entire Old Testament. Sometimes it is describing a particular part of the Old Testament, uh, a particular part of the New Testament, <clears throat> or a larger part of the New Testament as a whole. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.18, uh, here Paul combines both Old and New Testament doctrine and designated them both as scripture. For he writes, 1 Timothy 5.18, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And that comes from Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, chapter 25, verse 4, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And that comes from Leviticus 19, and he's using both in order to frame his argument for his letter to Timothy, which is also scripture. How do we know that? Because even Peter uh, labels Paul's writings as scripture. Peter writes, as also in all his letters, that is Paul's letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, and those of you who have read a good portion of the Apostle Paul can realize that sometimes some of the things that he writes is difficult to understand. If you don't believe me, go read Romans chapter 8. For those things that I wish to do, I do not do. Those things that I don't want to do, that I find myself doing. Who will deliver me from this body of death, he will say. <clears throat> sometimes these things can be difficult to grasp. And even the Apostle Peter mentions that. He says, which the untaught and unstable distort, that is Paul's teachings, as they do also, watch this, the rest of the scripture. So Peter understands that what Paul is writing in terms of his apostolic authority, that which he writes is to be equated with scripture. So what is inspiration? Inspiration simply means that God carried men along so that they wrote the message in the Bible, that is, that God superintended, which means to carry along, the human authors of the Bible so that they composed and recorded without error his message to mankind in the words of their original writings. Now, sometimes people 
will get confused on this. You say, well, wait a minute, what are we saying that God is like speaking and the apostles are taking dictation, much like what we you know, remember from the secretaries and so on. That's not what the doctrine of inspiration means. What it means is, is that God used the characters, the traits, the abilities, the learning, the language of the authors, so that what they wrote was the word of God. He's using the human personality, but back behind that is the direction of God, the Holy Spirit, who superintends so that the message of the apostles is the word of God. That is, it is becomes the word of God. Dr. Ari said it this way. He said, we should never lose sight of the incredible claims the Bible makes for itself. In this matter of inspiration, no other book can compare with it. God breathed it, men wrote it, and we possess it. <clears throat> so that's the doctrine of inspiration. Like I said, uh, a lot of times when we come to the study of bibliology, it's not really an overly sophisticated kind of doctrine, so we can normally go through it pretty quickly in terms of how we got our Bible, how we can trust our Bible. Uh, the one that uh, people struggle with, particularly in our postmodern setting, is the doctrine of inerrancy. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this particular doctrine. We're going to look at what inerrancy means, why inerrancy is true, and then why inerrancy is important to you. So what does it mean when we say that the Bible is inerrant? Dr. John MacArthur in his Systematic Theology book, which by the way, I thought about using for this class, but it's about like that thick. And I'm like, mm, that's probably a little much. That'll be for uh, you know a couple years down the road. Uh, but in his book, he says it this way. When applied to scripture, biblical inerrancy means that the Bible is without error in the original copies, or that is the original manuscripts. We don't have any of the original manuscripts that the uh, apostles wrote. We have many, many copies of that original manuscript, and we have so many co copies, actually, uh, that Dan Wallace, who is a textual critic who uh, works at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, um, our church and pastor where, where Tavri and I used to attend, we're very good friends with him, and he came in one Sunday, and uh, Saturday and Sunday, and gave a seminar on basically how we can trust our Bible. It's a little exercise that he called the, the gospel according to Snoopy. And from all of the copies, and when there were various copies of the Bible, three main sources, you can basically take those copies and then construct back to the original as close as possible the, the, the text of the scripture. Now, he didn't use the Bible. He used other manuscripts and we even tried to trick them. I mean, seminary students are notorious for always trying to trick their profs. There was a bunch of seminary students in the class. And so we intentionally messed it up to where I didn't think he was going to be able to do it. And he had a difficult time doing it, but he was able to go back and through these various manuscripts construct an original uh, writing that he wrote that was very, very close to the copy or the lost copy. We called it the lost copy. It obviously wouldn't lost, but uh, so though so textual criticism that's their goal to be able to reconstruct from various manuscripts and come back to the closest uh, intent and meaning of that of the original authors. But we don't have the original manuscripts today. All we have are the copies. Um, and so what biblical inerrancy applies to is that original autograph, that is that original writing that the apostles wrote. Uh, this, this is an NASB, New American Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, the young lady over there just gave me a new King James Version of the New Testament. Both of these books did not come into print by looking at the original letters of the apostles again, because they no longer exist. But people who work in translation, and there are many of those, um, they always go back to the copies. So it's not copies of copies, and they didn't sit down with, uh, you know, 1611 King James and come up with the new King James, or what have you. Uh, they always go back to the manuscript to do that. Which, by the way, um, our seminary, the Master Seminary, 
Uh, scholars from that are coming out with a new translation, which I think will, will rival that of the New King James. It's called the Legacy Standard Bible. Um, a copy of it is online. For example, in the Old Testament, you know, those of us grew up in church, you always know that when you see the word Lord, L-O-R-D, and it's all in caps, uppercase, that that's really the word Yahweh. They just write it as Lord. And if it's a lowercase Lord, um, it can be, you know, Master, Lord, what have you. Uh, well, the Legacy Standard Bible actually goes back and makes those words like Lord, Yahweh. So it'll say Yahweh in your Bibles. Uh, so no other translation has done that today. Um, so I think it should be out sometime within the next year, but I think you can see some of it online now. So getting back to Johnny Mac, um, what it means is that the Bible is without error in the original copies that is in the original manuscripts. It is therefore free when properly interpreted from affirming anything that is untrue or contrary to fact. Now, sometimes people will get the word infallible and inerrancy confused. Uh, for example, the word infallibility means that Scripture is unable to err, mislead, or fail in accomplishing its divine purpose. Inerrancy, on the other hand, means that Scripture is completely true in everything that it affirms regarding matters of science, history, geography, theology, man, sin, salvation, man's purpose in life, and so on. Uh, in other words, it is without any error. So in matters uh, of science, even though the Bible is not a book of science, in matters where it speaks of science, it's absolutely correct. In matters of human psychology, though the Bible is not a book on psychology, but where it does speak to that issue, it is absolutely correct. So the difference fundamentally between infallibility and inerrancy is infallibility means the Bible is unable, unable to fail or err in its purpose or intent. Inerrancy means that it is completely true in everything that it affirms. <clears throat> So why is inerrancy true? Why is it true? Three reasons to give. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So let's look and see what God says in reference to why the Bible is inerrant. John 17, in the high priestly prayer of Jesus, Jesus speaking to uh, the Father says of the Father, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. In Psalm 119, uh, the psalmist writes, The very essence of your words is truth. All your just regulations will stand forever. And in Hebrews 6, 18, the writer notes, It is impossible for God to lie. So what do we say then? We can affirm with what Paul says in reference to 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, that all scripture, that is the whole Bible, is theonoustos, that is God breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That should be 2 Timothy 3, 16, not 15. <clears throat> also, what God says the Bible says, and what the Bible says is what God says. They say, well, what's the difference? Watch this. For example, God speaking to Genesis, uh, to Abraham in Genesis 12, this is where he calls Abraham, out of, or Abram as he's known at this time, out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and he enters into a covenant with him. Now the Lord said to Abram, now later on in Galatians, Paul, speaking of this God entering into a relationship with Abram said this, uh, the scripture preached to Abraham saying, well, wait a minute, it wasn't the scripture that actually preached, it was God who spoke to Abraham, and yet what God says is equated with scripture. Moreover, what scripture says is equated to what God says. Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Over in Matthew chapter 19, 
Jesus is being uh, asked in reference to a question. Um, and he said, that is he, God said, that a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two become one flesh. So here, what God says is what the Bible says that is scripture and what scripture affirms is what God says. So if we can uh, think about it this way, and Paul does a, a great job of explaining that here, for this reason, we constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, so here you have the apostles who were preaching to these people, and what they were preaching is called the word of God. You accepted it not as the word of men, because they were men who were proclaiming this truth, but notice what he says. But you took it for what it really is, namely the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. So even the, the preached word of God by the apostles concerning doctrine, matters of salvation, is deemed to be the word of God. So <clears throat> what is the proof then that inerrancy is true in reference to God the Father? Because God is truth and cannot err and cannot err. Uh, the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, the Bible is true and cannot err. Those of you who've taken courses in philosophy or logic probably recognize this. This is called a syllogism, uh, where you deal with a couple of premises and a conclusion. But that's not the only argument. <clears throat> we also have the argument from God the Son. <clears throat> Whatever the Son of God affirms as true is true. Jesus affirmed that the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, the Bible is the word of God and true. Consider what Jesus said about the veracity of Scripture. He affirmed the divine authority of the Bible. When Jesus, after, his baptized, after he was baptized in the Jordan River, was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, he was tested, that is, he was tempted many days and nights by the adversary, Satan, the evil one. Each and every time he was tempted, he responded on the basis of the word of God. Really what this is, is the test of the second Adam. You'll recall the first Adam was in the garden, and God said, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, dying you will die, or dying you will surely die. <clears throat> and so the man and the woman kind of pondered, reflected upon it, and then it, Moses, who writes the book, even included the motives. Well, when they, she, that is Eve, saw that it was pleasing to the eye, desirable to make one wise and good for food, she took and ate and then gave some to her husband, which Moses adds, who was also with her. At no time did they reconvene in their thinking, or did one say to the other, hey, wait a minute, that's not what God said. God said, don't touch it, don't eat it. But here, the Lord is tempted in the very same way by the appeal of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Exactly the avenue approach that Satan took with Adam and Eve. However, at this temptation, it was indeed different. For in Matthew 4, Jesus responded to the temptation. It is written, man shall not live <clears throat> on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And at his second temptation, he responded, it is written, shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In Deuteronomy 6. And then he said during his third temptation, in reference to Satan saying, well, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And he responded, it is written, each and every time his appeal was made on the basis of the word of God. <clears throat> Jesus also affirmed not just the authority of the Bible, but the indestructibility of the Bible. Look at what he said over in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets, that is the scriptures, which was a common phrase, uh, the law and the prophets used to uh, signify the entire Old Testament. 
He said, I didn't come to abolish that, I did, uh, but to fulfill it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So the word of God stands forever. He also affirmed the unbreakability of the Bible over in John 10. Speaking to the religious leaders, they try to trap him in a question. And because he was the master, you know, uh, and he could debate with anyone and win every time with one hand tied behind his back. He responded to them if he called them gods. And here he's speaking of the Old Testament judges who was referred to as God, but with a little g to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. He also affirmed the historicity of the Bible. For example, over in Matthew 24, he said, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what's, what's he doing? He's affirming the kind of condition that will be happening in the world, just like it was in the days of Noah. Well, if he's drawing a comparison from the time of Noah, what is he assuming? That Noah is an actual historical figure. Jesus also affirmed the scientific accuracy of the Bible <clears throat> in reference to man's origin. He answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and should be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So what's he saying? Uh, that man is not here as a process of evolution. He didn't start from a single cell, and then after a few million years, the cell became more complex uh, and so forth, as many who hold to uh, scientific evolution will espouse. Jesus clearly states here, that God is the one who created both men and women. Moreover, God is the determiner of all truth. Now notice I have empirical truth. Empir empirical truth simply means everything that you can learn about the world through your five senses, through hearing, through touch, through taste, smell, and so on. Jesus said in John 3, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you of earthly things, that is things which you can experience, see, hear, taste, smell, and so on. He says, if I told you of earth, earthly things and you're not getting that, in other words, you don't believe it, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? We get a little glimpse of that at the resurrection. The uh, disciples are in a locked room, and all of a sudden Jesus appears in their midst. Where did he come from? Did he walk through a wall? Is it possible or is it impossible? What Jesus is saying, look, if you're struggling with the ABCs of basic physics of this life, then I can't disclose to you the true meaning of knowledge that awaits the heavens one day. <clears throat> So why should one trust testi uh, Jesus' testimony regarding these scientific ass assertions? Because Paul says this in reference to Jesus. He says, for through him, that is Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. 
I mean, that, that's a magnanimous statement. Let me say that again. Everything. What does everything mean? Everything. Everything means everything. I looked that up in the Greek, and it means everything. Everything was created through him, that is, through Jesus, and for him. And then finally, in terms of our evidence, three reasons why the Bible cannot have any errors is because of God the Father, God the Son, and finally God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God and cannot err. The Bible was written by the Holy Spirit, therefore the Bible cannot err and is true. <clears throat> for example, the Holy Spirit spoke through men to produce the Bible. 2 Samuel 23, Samuel writes, The Spirit of the Lord spoke uh, by me, that is David, and his word was on my tongue. Uh, 2 Peter 1, But know this first of all, Peter notes, No prophecy of Scripture is ever a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will, <clears throat> but men moved to be passively brought forth or carried along. Think of the uh, idea as a little toy sailboat. Those of you who watch, watch videos or maybe made one when you were a kid. You put the sail on there and you put the boat in the water, and then all of a sudden you blow on the sail. Guess what? As the, the wind or the air hits the sail, it begins to move the boat along. That's the imagery here that we get by Peter's statement, <clears throat> that no prophecy was ever originated by the act of man's own will, but men who were moved or to be carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Rowry notes, <clears throat> though the Bible originated from God, it was actually written by men. It is God's word conveyed through the Holy Spirit. Sinful men wrote that word, but did so without error. Just as in the incarnation, Christ took humanity, but was not tainted in any way with sin. So the production of the Bible was not tainted with any errors. Now, let me talk to you for a second about what's called uh, textual variants. Sometimes in the ancient manuscripts, you'll find that as, <clears throat> as uh, scribes were copying the text, uh, it would go to one church and then they would copy and it would go to another church. Uh, an example of a variant would be like in one letter, they would say, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then in another variant, it might say, she was the mother of Jesus. So the pronoun she would be a reference to Mary. So is technically that a variant? Yes, that's a variant. But it doesn't mean that the intent of the meaning of the, of the scripture has been compromised or changed. There are over 50,000 variants. More than that, they're finding more all the time in the New Testament, but none of them Watch this. None of them have affected, the, have affected the meaning or doctrine of the Bible. None of them. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit produces the scriptures, and he also teaches the scriptures. In John 16, Jesus said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And over in 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul writes, For we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that, reason, we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So the Spirit is the one who writes the Bible, who inspires the Bible, and who also teaches the believer to understand it. So what we may conclude is God the Father cannot err, God the Son cannot err, God the Holy Spirit cannot err, therefore the Bible is the Word of God and cannot err. 
<clears throat> what about certain problematic verses that we find in the Bible that appear to be a contradiction? Are there some of those? Yes, there are. We won't go through every one of those tonight or we'll be here till midnight, but we'll look at a couple of the famous ones. For example, some critics of the Bible have said that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 give contradictory accounts of creation. <clears throat> How do we explain that? The answer is simply this. Genesis 1 gives us the chronological order of creation, and Genesis 2 gives a topical de detailed account of what happened during the days of creation. For example, in Genesis 1, animals are created before man. In Genesis 2, the animals are named after man is created. It does not say they were created after man, but that man named them, which God had already created. The reason I have to do that is there's a screen blocking my view on my things I have to look over. <clears throat> uh, another one is, the Bible says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. However, critics will say, no, that's not true. Science can prove that the orchid seed is the actual smallest of all seeds. If you look up here, uh, this is represented represented by a penny, right? So if we had a penny up there, you have mustard seeds of various sizes on the backside of Honest Abe's head. And then in the front, you see an orchid seed size comparison in relation to the penny. Obviously, the orchid seed is smaller than the mustard seed. So what do we deduce from that? Is Jesus telling a fib? How do we reconcile that? I'm glad you asked that question. It's a good one. <clears throat> the context of the passage, and this is a little side note in reference to hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. What drives your interpretation are three things, okay? So if you get nothing else from the class, get this. What drives your interpretation of the Bible are three things. Ready? Context, context, and context. Exactly. So, the context of the passage states that the mustard seed was the smallest one which a man took and sold in his field. It is not the smallest seed in the world of which the orchid seed wasn't even known in Judea at the time. <clears throat> Here's another one. The Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a large fish, perhaps a whale. Science and critics will say it is impossible for a man to be in a fish stomach for three days and come out alive. As a matter of fact, there was a young Christian boy who was attending school and his teacher asked him, who in here has ever heard of the story of Jonah and the whale? Of course, all the kids kind of raised their hand and they put their hands down. He goes, who in here believes this story is true? Only one hand went up. This brave boy's hand went up. She says, I can't believe that you would believe a man could be swallowed by a whale Stay in his stomach for three days and come out alive. How in the world would you prove that? And the little boy looked at her and he said, well, ma'am, I, I guess I don't really know. I'll have to wait till I get to heaven and then I can ask him. And she said, well, what if he's not in heaven, young man? He said, well, then you can ask him. I'm not quite sure what his grade was after that. <laughs> How do we answer that question? We answer it this way. Jonah's account is a divine miracle. God has the power and the ability and causes violations of physics and natural law. He's demonstrated it many times in scripture. Moreover, Jesus affirmed the historicity of this miraculous event in Matthew chapter 12. He said, for just as Jonah 
was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now he's making a comparison here. As Jonah was in this death trap of this whale's belly for three days and three nights and came out alive, so the Son of Man will be in the ground three days, three nights, and come out alive. The men of Nineveh, this is where Jonah went to to preach, to preach judgment, I might add. He said, the men of Nineveh will stand up with just this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What's the point? The point is Jesus affirmed the truthfulness of the story of Jonah and the great fish. Now, for those of you who like to dig down in the weeds in reference to all of these various so-called contradictions or discrepancies in the Bible, uh, Dr. Norm Geisler, who is in heaven now, he uh, uh, passed on last year. Uh, I got to meet him at uh, pre-trip study group a couple of years ago and sit down and talk with him. He's a phenomenal uh, scholar, teacher, seminary professor. Uh, but anyway, he and Thomas Howe wrote a book called The Big Book of Bible Difficulties. And I would highly recommend that you get the book because in it, beginning with the book of Genesis and going all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation, they discuss the supposed discrepancies in the Bible and then give you sound biblical answers to explain to critics uh, and for your own personal edification, uh, how to answer uh, these supposed contradictions. <clears throat> now, believing the Bible is inerrant. This is critical for those of us who engage in any form of teaching ministry or in any type of leadership position in the Bible, because this becomes your source of authority. Consider what one person has to say. The subject of inerrancy is critical because everything comes down to an authoritative text. Um, if you're going to be a preacher, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be a Christian pastor, missionary, or serve the Lord in any way, you must have confidence in the text of Scripture. The authority, the authority of Scripture, of scripture is, absolutely is absolutely everything. God, God saves by the Word. He sanctifies by the Word. He comforts by the Word. He edifies by the Word. The Word, the word does all spiritual work by the power of the Holy Spirit through Scripture. So the foundation of all ministry is the Word of God. And having a firm grasp of the authority and inerrancy of Scripture is the foundation. Uh, back, back in, in 1978, 1978, there was the uh, International Congress on Biblical Inerrancy, ICBI. They produced something called the Chicago Statement, which is a long and beautifully crafted, powerfully expressed statement on the inerrancy of Scripture. But that was 1978, long time ago. We have yeah. several, several generations, generations of young, young men who have grown up since that document was developed. was developed. And it isn't and that they're, they're against, against inerrancy. inerrancy. It is that they're, they're, sad to say, indifferent to it. To it. Uh, the, the pragmatic movement in the church has caused preachers to be more pragmatic, more interested in the culture, more interested in sort of adapting to the culture than speaking from an authoritative word. Uh, the, age the age of tolerance in which we live has, has caused, caused guys, guys to soften their message, message which means you eliminate certain things in, in scripture or you soften, soften the message. message. All, of All of those kinds of things, things uh, are, not are not an attack, attack on inerrancy, but, but indifference, indifference to an inerrant authoritative text is the same as an attack. I believe that in this generation of developing churches and pragmatic churches and seeker friendly churches, Young, young guys, guys that are coming, coming into, into the ministry, ministry and even older, older guys, guys now, now need, need to reaffirm their, their commitment to the to authority, authority and power of scripture. scripture. Mm -hmm. It's uh, so true for a lot of people. That's one of the things where um, that they always taught us in, in preaching class and those kinds of things. They said, look, when you get up there in front of people, okay, and I know there's differing thoughts on preaching and so on, but uh, all of the schools where I attended and the people who mentored me and so on, um, they would say, 
you can in make introductions. But if you ain't at the text in three minutes, you've got problems. You've got problems. Because now the congregation is going to say, okay, what kind of sermon am I going to be getting now? Is this going to be something you're going to tell me like, you know, five steps to have a better looking yard or, or what? Um, the reason that that is so prevalent today, particularly in this country, is because churches have become more man-centered rather than God-centered. And the fallout of that is we are producing churches that are driven and mo motivated by goats and not sheep. And so the only way that we're going to recover that and get that back is we've got to start with this and we have to end with this and we have to stand on this all the time. There was an older black lady in one of the churches I preached in. She's every time she would get the, the pastors would get up there. She's like, OK. And she was like, time. OK, that's one minute down. Let's go. Let's go. You better be getting to the text, because if you ain't getting to the text in three minutes, she's going to tell you. You know, so I'm not saying we need to start that, you know, around here or anything, because I, I, mean, I think I think we do a great uh, I think Craig and them do a great job. But and by the way, let me also add and when I do offer criticism and so on, I don't like have a church in mind. Uh, I'm pretty straightforward up here. If I do have something or that's like made it into the news or whatever, because the pastors either said something or did something, I'll make a comment on. Uh, but don't think like when I criticize the pulpit, I'm not speaking about like our church, like here. I'm just talking in general the way churches are. So why, why is in inerrancy important to you or why should it be important to you? Because the Bible is our standard. Biblical inerrancy is important because it means that the Bible is a trustworthy standard for what we are to believe and how we are to live. The Baptist faith and message, which this is one of the uh, doctrinal creeds that we have. Um, you know, sometimes Baptists will say things like, you know, we have no creed but Jesus. But what they don't seem to realize is that's a creed. Uh, to say we have no creed but Jesus. And there's nothing really wrong with creeds historically because they are basically a summation of what a church or perhaps a denomination may believe or hold. And that's the case with the Baptist faith and message. Um, in reference to the Bible, this is what it says. <clears throat> uh, the Holy Bible, which is, this is on the website, by the way, so if you want to go there and look at it. Um, the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, <clears throat> salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals principles by which God judges us <clears throat> and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union. And the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, Religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony of Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. So, I feel very confident, at least in uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, at least as it stands right now. For those of you who are keeping up with what's going on within the SBC, uh, it is struggling. Uh, there's a lot of things going on right now, but their view of the Bible, as it stands now, is absolutely correct. <clears throat> so what does that mean for us? It means that the Bible is a tool. It's a tool that God uses to reshape us, to conform us to the image of Christ by reprogramming your thinking. All change that you will ever make, either good or bad, in your life starts here in between your two ears. Notice what Paul writes in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. 
and do not be conformed to this world. By that, what he means is don't be conformed to this world's way of thinking, worldly mindedness. He says, but <clears throat> be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. As the psalmist writes, as a man thinks or reasons within himself, so is he. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So it's our standard. Also, the Bible is valuable. Why? First and foremost, because it is living. The Bible is alive and it produces life. Look at what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. He writes, <clears throat> Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, to speak, uh, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Now that's interesting because he's not bringing up a point in reference to the past. What he says is this, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, this is a present tense verb. It's an active voice. It's indicative, meaning the Holy Spirit is saying this like right now. To each of us, the Holy Spirit is saying this right now. The word is speaking. The word is living. The word is active. Paul writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for, this is the reason, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel, namely the content of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When someone says, what must I do to be saved? They must have the content of the gospel. That is the means that God has chosen to use to regenerate and save individuals. So you have to have a content of data. You have to put your trust in that data. In other words, you have to believe it to be true. And then the third facet of saving faith is believing or trusting in it. Almost like, you know, if I were to have Alan come up here and take a chair and say, Alan, sit in that chair. You believe that chair will hold you? Yes. Okay, well, he's currently not sitting in the chair. So even though he may have cognitive data in his head that the seat will hold him until he's sitting in the chair, he's not trusting in the chair. Until one is believing in Christ and trusting in Christ, one is not saved. Just believing Jesus was a historical figure doesn't do anything. I believe Abraham Lincoln was a historical figure, but I'm not trusting in Abraham Lincoln to get me to heaven. I'm trusting on Jesus to get me there. Question. Repentance would be synonymous with exercising faith, uh, particularly when you see in Acts 17, for example, uh, you know, one of the phrases John likes to use, and John, you'll see, believe. John 3, 16, uh, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that the one believing in him, that's a present tense participle, so it's the believing ones, right? That's present tense. So if one is believing or trusting in him, repentance comes about as a result of, and it simply means to change one's thinking. So as Paul is preaching to the uh, pagan philosophers at Acts 17 on top of Mars Hill, he says to them, God is now requiring, demanding, that everyone everywhere repent. Repent about what? Repent about who Jesus is or what you think that he is and trust in him for your salvation. So many times repentance and exercising faith are used synonymously. There are some who like to break that up uh, who are associated with free grace theology, um, but I don't think that argument holds water if you look at everything they have to say. I believe, and most scholars would hold, uh, that repentance and faith are synonymous, that both take place at the time of conversion. For one cannot believe in Jesus unless one has reconfigured his or her thinking to understand something about him that they didn't previously know or believe. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Right. Re repentance, though, understand it this way. Re repentance with a view of changing thinking. If you're talking about repentance with a view to changing behaviors, now you're talking about discipleship. Right. In other words, let's take a person who who lived a real rough life. And I'll, I'll use Jim Adams because he always liked when I used to talk about him like this. because He'd be the first one to say, praise the name of Jesus. Right. And so he's in heaven now. Um, but if you take a life like his, someone who was a drug addict, someone who sold drugs, someone who was on the opposite side of the law, um, and then all of a sudden they get saved. So they wake up day one of salvation. How is his thinking going to be? Fundamentally, he's still going to be fleshly. He's a new creature in Christ, no doubt, but he still has the old life that he has to get reprogrammed. So until he begins to mature in faith, which is a process, and that's information plus time plus application will move one to spiritual maturity. But until that time, you know, we can ex still expect to make someone who's a new believer because they're babes in Christ, or they're going to make messes. So repentance with a view to changing one's ethical standards or behavior, that's a process of discipleship. In order to get one into the kingdom, all one must do is to believe, period. The proof of that, by the way, would be the thief on the cross. Um, he, he didn't have a theology. He didn't have a doctrine. He didn't understand Jesus being the coming Messiah. But all he said was, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that was all it took. Simple faith. Is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, no, and I agree with it. For those of you who may not hear him, he said. Uh, the, the main thing that we have to do with, in the process or case of evangelism, one must understand what it is they are being saved from. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at heaven the way that retired people look at Florida. They want to go there because the weather's nice and they think most of their relatives are there, right? That's not the offer. The gospel is not fire insurance. It's all about understanding we need a savior. And so you're absolutely right in that. And I didn't want to leave that out. So if you're uh, he's absolutely right. One cannot understand the beauty of the gospel until it's weighed against the backdrop of my sinfulness and the, the people's sinfulness. And what shows them that? The law. The law will show them how sinful they truly are. That's why Paul spends the first three chapters in the book of Romans telling everyone in the human race how nasty and pitiful and sinful they are. Because he can't bring you the good news and for, until he first brings you bad news. And that, beloved, ties us right back into Romans 1.16 when Paul says that's why the gospel is powerful. That's the means God uses to bring those into the faith. So the Bible is living and it is active. It is, is, to, it is powerfully effective to enable or equip or uh, in working. It is the ability to transform your life. Paul writes in Romans 15, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Uh, the Bible is sharp. It has the ability to cut finer than a two-edged sword. It is piercing in that it plunges to the innermost thoughts of man's heart and soul. Um, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and is piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit or of uh, both joints and marrow and able to judge, watch this, the Bible is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You say, come on, how does it do that? I'm glad you ask. Um, for example, over in James chapter 4, he asked a question of the church. Just to give you a little bit of background, I know we're rushing on time, so let me give you the Cliff Notes version. 
when James is writing to his audience, he's writing to believers. And he asks the question, what is the source of conflicts and quarrels among you? That is those in the church. Now, this is where he's going to get down into the brass tacks of not just looking at an argument, but what is the motive and cause of arguments? Fundamentally, it's this, that people don't think alike. People don't think alike. That's why the Arabs and the Jews are never going to get together. Why? Because fundamentally, they have differing worldviews. But James puts his, puts his finger on the heart of the matter. He said, here's the cause. Is not the source, that is the source of conflicts, your pleasures. Now, the word pleasures there comes from the Greek word hedone, from where we get our English word hedonism, seeking pleasure for the sake of pleasure, right? He says, the reason you have is because you want things your way so that you can do what you want to do to gratify your senses, that is to wage war in your members, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. Maybe not physical murder, but you murder someone's character with your tongue. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel because you want what other people have and don't have it. You do not have because you do not ask, and you do not ask, you ask and you do not receive, God said. So he said, look, don't come to me with that. God, if you just give me a million dollars in a Ferrari, He says, because you ask with wrong motives. What motives, James? So that you may spend it on your own pleasures. The hedone there. You want to be able to do it so you can drive down the street in that brand new Ferrari saying, look how cool I am. I'm moving next door to Joel. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. <laughs> he said, true Bible readers and Bible searchers never find it wearisome. They like it least who know it least, and they love it most who read it most. So as we leave here tonight, walk away with this thought. If you learn anything about, about the Bible, learn this, that this book is milk for infants. This book is meat for the mature. This book is a lamp that shines. This book is a mirror that reveals. This book is the seed that produces life. This book is a fire that consumes. This book is a hammer that shatters. This book is a sword that cuts. This book is life for those who find it. This book is living bread. This book is the sword of the spirit. This book is light for the path. This book is a revealer of the Lord Jesus Christ. For John writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the power of this book. So we are to know it. We are to love it. We are to live it. We are to teach it. We are to, we are to lift it up, let it loose and let it fly. So my prayer for you as we leave here tonight is you will have a newfound respect for the truthfulness of this book.